20 is on Saturday, high force. That was yesterday. <clears throat> As our world is changing, taking down old ideas and changing, trying to change history, let's hope that they don't change this state. Because this is a it should last forever. As we bring forth our tithes and offerings, let's thank God for the many blessings He has given us. So we pray. Give me, Father, to come to you this morning to just thank you for the many blessings you provide for each one of us in this church, in this country. We ask you to continue to watch over the, the leaders of this country, the, the locals, state, and national. Uh, just be with them that they will make the right decisions and your under your, under your uh, guidance and presence. We just thank you for your continued guidance with us so that we can make, make the right decision for you in this community. In Jesus' name we do ask. Amen. Amen. Time to introduce Glenn. I, you probably know him better than I know. I don't know that much about Glenn. I just know that uh, whenever we need to book with Bill and we call him, he's been here. <laughs> so, you know, Glenn and Sue are here today with us, and so we're just going to yeah. Can I say with me? Sure. I want to thank the Lord for you standing up there and singing and praying today because John was a very sick man, and there's a lot of empty prayers standing right there today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. If you talk to Jane, she'll probably tell I'm still sick. <laughs> I'm so happy you're standing up there today. Yeah. So am I. Yes. So am I. Yes. That means God wasn't done with me. He's not God has answered a lot of prayers. I assume I don't have to wear my mask while I preach. Although, and no one has told me this verbally. But I can see it in their eyes. Some people think I look a lot better with the mask on. <laughs> Anybody ever said that to you yet? <laughs> All the time. Just about every fall of the year, we see these tourist attractions that feature an intricate pattern of pathways that are made through some kind of vegetation, usually a cornfield. And they're made so that you can't see, the corn is tall enough, you can't see really where you're going. You just have to figure out which way to turn at every junction and try to find your way out of there. It's called a maze, M-A-Z-E. Because the definition of a maze, and this is directly from the uh, dictionary, a maze is a confusingly intricate network of passages. Confusingly, meaning it's hard. It's going to turn you around several times. You're going to be going the wrong direction. You're going to make the wrong turn. You can just count on them. So the challenge is to find your way out of that maze M-A-I-Z-E, maze, M-A-Z-E. People wander around in these walkways trying to find the exit. I've never been in one, but my guess is that there are people who get confused and start getting a little anxiety building up because they turn this way and they turn that way and it seems to lead nowhere close to the exit. I would imagine, have any of you ever been in one of these that I'm talking about? There we go. I would imagine that there are some people, maybe quite a few, who need help. Anybody going to raise their hand on that? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it becomes so confusing, you become so disoriented in a situation like that, that you just really need somebody to say, this is the way to go. Let me take your hand and show you the way out of here. Well, I think there's an incredible parallel that we can draw from that experience or that situation because it seems to me that a lot of people spend much, if not most, of their lives in a maze. 
They seem to be wandering around most of their lives, not knowing which way to turn, not knowing what decision to make, not knowing which direction their life ought to take. And so they try all sorts of things, like the path that goes this way or the path that goes this way. Which way do I turn? Well, I'll try this, I'll try that. They spend a lot of their lives seeking to find direction, purpose, hope, all kinds of meaning in their life. And so when one of those decisions fails to bring purpose or meaning or hope or whatever they're looking for, when that fails, they try another thing that's popular in the day. And when that fails, when that brings no lasting satisfaction, it's on to another dead end. It's just one disappointing, hope-robbing choice after another. The Gospel of Mark tells us about a man in a maze. But it wasn't a cornfield maze. It was a life maze. His life was a mess. He had no hope. He didn't know how to escape the dilemma that he was in. And what this man discovered was that Jesus has real answers for the issues that are above our ability to solve in this life. So perhaps, I hope, I pray that you will find some kind of new direction in making the decision, the next decision you need to make, or in the whole direction of your life. I hope there will be some help as we study this passage today that will help you discover the amazing man, Jesus, and how he has the answer for your life. So Kevin, if you'll put that next slide up, it tells you the passage, Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. A great story. I'm sure you're familiar with it. I just want to remind you of a few things that it teaches us or points out to us as we come together in the name of Christ this morning. They, meaning Jesus and his disciples, went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission. I think that's a funny word. Instead of commanding the evil spirits, he gave them permission. And the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, 
Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. What does this incident teach us about our amazing Lord? I suppose the most obvious thing of all that it teaches is that Jesus wields amazing power. One of the first things that Mark emphasizes in his record here is how powerful these demons were who controlled this man. They had literally taken over this man's life and given him superhuman power and strength. He could rip apart metal chains. He could break iron shackles with his bare hands. The man empowered by demons was an incorrigible danger to everyone around, including himself. He had even deteriorated to the point where he was cutting himself with stones that he would find with a sharp edge. He was dangerous to everyone, including himself. He intimidated people with his strength and his unflinching fear of no one. It seems that they had tried to control him with the chains and the shackles in the past, but now it's gone to the point where they won't even try to do that. He is so powerful, so dangerous. He was an out-of-control madman, literally. Mad because of the influence of the devil and the devil's demons inside him. But I want you to notice, in contrast to that, what happens in verses 6 and 7. I think this is so very interesting in verses 6 and 7, he cowered at the feet of Jesus. He cowered. All this power, all this strength, all this incorrigible energy and, and danger cowers at the feet of Jesus. The demons immediately recognize that they had no choice but to submit to the higher authority of Jesus. And perhaps for the first time in their existence, these demons experienced fear when Jesus came near. Isn't that interesting? Afraid of no one and nothing, but Jesus walks on the shore and they cower in fear. They were outranked. If you've ever served in the military, you know what that means, to be outranked. When a general or a, a, an officer walks by, you're outranked. And Jesus came on shore, and the demons knew intuitively that they were outranked. They were, for the first time in their existence, in the presence of someone more powerful more influential than they were. Now, I don't want you to draw the wrong conclusion. I am not suggesting that anyone at the Goshen Christian Church is demon-possessed. That's not why I'm preaching about this. Although, I was warned and reminded again this morning never to bring a string back into this church building. Some of you may or may not remember that, but it's a pretty important part of your history, my history with you. <laughs> I'm not suggesting you're demon-possessed, but I think there is something you and I can learn. Okay, I'll include myself in that. There's something we can learn from this, even though we're not that far gone. Most of us are wrestling with influences or habits or substances or recurring thoughts things that have more power over us than we can handle on our own. Most of us, maybe in secret, are wrestling with something that is just a little stronger than we are. And sometimes those things just creep in slowly, 
They don't come in powerfully all at once and just knock us to the floor. They just kind of creep into our lives and they get deeper roots and deeper roots and all of a sudden they do have a power that we didn't intend to give them. And they make us miserable. These habits, these, these substances, these thoughts or influences that we uh, allow in to gradually have influence in our lives, they force us to do things that we know are not right, they're not good, they're not healthy. They get a grip on us that is too powerful that we cannot defeat on our own. But the reminder, I think, in this passage is don't forget that you're not alone. You're not fighting this battle by yourself. Jesus is available. Jesus has the power. Jesus has the authority to overcome whatever that influence in your life might be. Jesus wields amazing power, even over the things that we can't control. We see it over and over even in our day and age, that Jesus has this great ability to clean up a life, to set it on a, a different path, to turn it around, to straighten it out, and help people overcome in a remarkable way what they can't overcome by themselves. When you turn over to Jesus, that area of your life that's out of control, whether a little or a lot, when you turn it over to Him, His divine ability to cleanse, to heal, to restore is truly amazing. I think I had that too close, don't I, Ken? It's amazing because He is so much more powerful than anything else in our lives or in this world. Another thing I believe we're taught or reminded by this incident in the Gospel of Mark is that Jesus brings about amazing change. Now I want you to keep in mind how all the people who lived in this area were afraid of this man. He could no longer be bound. It says in verse 3, no one could bind him any more. And that's just a loaded statement. No one could bind him anymore, suggesting that they did bind him at one time. But now they can't. Now they won't even try. His aggressive behavior has, has gradually worsened over the course of time, and it's beyond anything they can do about it. They no longer could bind him. They couldn't bind him anymore. So by the time of this incident, this man is completely out of touch with society. He's completely mastered by the demons, and people know he's dangerous. They know not to go near him. They're afraid of him. They avoid him at all costs. So now picture this. After the demons are defeated and sent away, there sits this man dressed in blue jeans and a polo shirt and tennis shoes. Or whatever they wore in those days. Here he sits, looking normal. Acting normal. He's acting like a perfectly normal, well-adjusted human being. Something the people in the area, even his family, have not seen for a very long time. How would you react to that? People from the town, the people who knew the man, when they came out, they found it pretty hard to believe. Imagine that. They found it hard to believe that he's normal, that he's sitting there on a rock or whatever. And he, he just... Joe that we used to know. I wonder if maybe this wasn't the most dramatic change of a life these people have ever seen. I'm guessing it was. The most dramatic change that had ever come over anybody they had ever run across. They just could not believe their eyes. So they did what most of us would have done 
They became afraid. They were filled with fear. Why were they filled with fear? One of the best things that's ever happened in their lives, or in, certainly in this man's life, one of the best things that's ever happened to anyone that they've ever known, and they're afraid? Afraid of what? Are they afraid that the man is just acting normal and trying to draw them in closer? And then he's going to attack them? Or are they afraid of the power that overpowered the greatest power they've ever seen? Did they know that it was demons inside this man? And what could overcome a legion of demons. I think perhaps they were afraid of the power that had cured this man. One thing is for sure, the change that Jesus brought about in this man's life was dramatic. It was evident to every person there. It was outstanding, the change that had taken place. And that makes me wonder, can people see the change that Jesus has made in my life, in your life? The people we work with, the people we, we associate with, the, the people that uh, we live nearby. Can people see the difference that God has made in our lives? Because it sure seems to me that part of the story is that it's evident that when divine power changes your life, that it's evident. When He's touched you, when He's cleaned you up, when He's cleansed you, when He's changed your habits, has He given you more kindness? That's what, that's what I wonder about. Is it evident to other people in our lives that we're kinder, that we're more gracious, that we're more patient? Is that evident that I'm better than I used to be? Don't ask my wife about that. She's been working on me for a long, long time. And I'm hopefully moving in the right direction. And I hope you're moving in the right direction also. But you see, if you're still living like you were before Jesus came into your life, then maybe it's not so evident that He's brought about much change. If you still have the same kind of attitude toward people and, and react toward situations the same way you used to, you know, maybe some of that needs to be submitted to Jesus. Maybe He wants to change some things that you haven't even realized He might want to be upgrading in your life. Because it sure seems to me like the change that He brings about is evident. And ought to be evident. Well, one more thing I want to point out. I think we learned from this incident that Jesus offers amazing hope. Amazing hope. Now, I have a question for you that I really want you to answer, at least in your own mind. Okay? Which do you think was the greater miracle? Which do you think was the greater miracle? The fact that Jesus defeated multiple demons? Or the fact that Jesus restored hope into this man's life? Which was the greater miracle? When the townsfolk came out to the site of the miracle, they saw the man sitting down clothed and, quote, in his right mind. Pretty dramatic, huh? In his right mind. We're suddenly getting a picture here of normality being totally and instantly restored to this man's life. 
then some other things happen. And as Jesus is leaving the scene, this formerly possessed man wants to go with him. Now that doesn't seem so out of character, does it? That, that he might want to follow Jesus? I mean, it seems to me to be pretty natural in light of all that Jesus has done for him that he might want to follow Jesus, he might want to learn more about Jesus, he might want to serve Jesus. And even in that culture, there was this idea that if you save my life, then I belong to you. I'll follow you wherever you go. I'll do whatever you say. I belong to you because you saved me. So there's even that element going on in this man's uh, thinking that he, he is now totally given to Jesus because of what Jesus has done for him. But as it turns out, Jesus has other plans for this man than just to follow him. Jesus sent him back. Sent him back to live with his family and to tell about God's goodness and God's mercy. And you must realize since they were raising hogs in this area and, and this is the Decapolis, this is not Israel. These are not Jews. This man was probably not a Jew that Jesus cast the demons out of. So he's sending them back into a pagan culture, not even a, a, with a Hebrew background or a Jewish background. He's sending this man back into a culture that maybe doesn't even recognize the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to tell about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and how good this God is and how powerful this God is. So Jesus is sending him back as an ambassador. Now, it's pretty hard to imagine what his, this man's family may have gone through the last few years. Imagine the, the shame brought upon this family because of this man's condition. People didn't understand the demonic possession thing. They, they probably didn't understand why he had become so incorrigible, so mean, so, so nasty, even so powerful physically. So, they probably wrote him off and, and wondered if something wrong with his family too. You know, how, how did he get to be like that? Well, look at his wife. <laughs> look at his dad. His dad wasn't the nicest guy in the world. They were thinking all kinds of thoughts like that about him, about his situation. So Jesus is sending him back into a family situation that has been scarred irreparably, perhaps, because of what he has gone through. So his family, I would suggest, probably needs him now more than ever before. They need him normal more than ever before because of what they've gone through. So he's being sent back to be reunited with his loved ones and presumably... I think we can read between the lines here and not violate the scriptures. Presumably, he's being sent back to re-enter society, to, re to re-enter as a productive worker, as a productive citizen, as a good neighbor. Okay, but you realize more than that happened? Much more than that happened. He began telling his story about Jesus, and it says, in all the cities of the area, so we're told this was the Decapolis, ten cities. There were ten villages or cities in the immediate area within easy walking distance of each other. And he began telling his story in these ten cities. He didn't just go home. He went to others too, not just to his family, but to neighboring towns. This guy's excited. He has a powerful energy and excitement going on in his life. The dramatic change in his life is flowing through him and being told about to other people. Even those people who ask Jesus to leave their neighborhood are hearing over and over how good God is. 
They're hearing about God's mercy, God's power, God's love, how this man's life purpose and hope have been restored. And once again, I think the story points to us in at least an indirect way because even while we were still sinners, God loved us and Jesus died for us. The Bible says that directly, doesn't it? Even while we were still sinners. So He embraced us. He changed us. He gave us a story to tell about His mercy and grace. Just like what He gave this man. He gave us something to tell about, talk about, to share with others. What a great story it is. You and I have been liberated liberated from sinful ways. We've been liberated from evil powers. We've been liberated from unholy habits by the mercy of God. He loved us even while we were still sinners. So my final question to you, have you met this amazing man? His name is Jesus. And he will change your life if you let him. Have you given him the chance to fill you with his never-ending grace, love, and peace? Are we going to sing a decision song? I'll turn it back over to you.